Please join me as we pray for God to illumine the word that we share today. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, open our understanding so that we may receive the word of life. Amen. Our second reading this morning comes from the book of Romans, chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. Listen now for the word of God. Welcome those who are weak in faith but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on the slaves of another? It is before their Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day observe it for the Lord. Also those who eat, eat for the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain for the Lord and give thanks to God. For we do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each one of us will be held accountable. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I need to tell you something that I have not okayed with my husband, Jason, to tell you. (laughs) You see, whenever I'm going to tell a story that involves Jason or our son, Jonas, or whenever I'm going to make an announcement about our family life together to all of you, I always clear it with Jason to make sure that he's okay with me sharing whatever it is, but not today, because I know he does not want me to tell you this. Over the summer, I became a vegetarian. I did it for health reasons. I'm not a perfect vegetarian. I've had a meal or two in the last four months that included meat. I think I might actually be a pescatarian and still eat seafood when I'm near the ocean, for example. I'll be a pescatarian, Presbyterian. But the shame, the shame of being the first gentleman who brought you his trademark event, meat. M-E-A-T, meet me at the fire pit, married to a vegetarian, for shame. And I'll also tell you that when I dropped into a fellowship committee meeting last Sunday, they were making plans for a big family night supper in October, October 27th, it's a Friday night, by the way. And as they went over the menu, Bill said, But don't worry, we know you've become a vegetarian. So we're working on a recipe for the main dish that doesn't include meat. Now suddenly, some of you aren't laughing anymore, right? No more meat at the church supper? What's next? Weird vegetarian dishes and vegan foods at our potlucks? I'm kidding. The fellowship committee did assure me that there would be a vegetarian option, but you will still get a meat-filled version of the main dish. It's an Italian dinner, by the way. And even though I am bringing vegetarian beans to the homecoming potluck, 
I'm sure that somebody else will bring the chicken and this church will probably survive the pastor becoming one of those weak vegetable eaters, as Paul so eloquently puts it in Romans 14. But silly examples aside, we know that we are living in a time where there is much potential for disagreement and division and disunity in the church. As a nation, as a society, we've become so polarized. And that, unfortunately, has creeped into congregations. Disunity has become a problem for us modern-day Christians. It was also a problem for the earliest Christians. Romans is Paul's longest letter. It's kind of his magnum opus. He was not the one who planted the church in Rome. And when he wrote the letter, he had not yet been there. So the letter served sort of as his introduction as an apostle. In the first half of Romans, Paul writes about God's love for those who are in Christ. In the second half of Romans, Paul invites the church to consider how that love invites them to live with love for others, specifically their siblings in Christ. The church grew so quickly in the first century, and it came to include people from a diversity of backgrounds. It was really monumental to have a a worshiping setting that included so much diversity, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, wealthy and poor, men and women and children from all over the known world, worshiping together, uniting under one name. In Romans 14, Paul is writing to a church that has people who are insisting that according to Jewish law, some foods are to be avoided and certain days are holy days or fast days and need to be observed in particular ways. There are also Christians in the church who have no Jewish background and who believe that Christ has freed his followers from all of those laws and ceremonial traditions, and they can eat whatever they want without regard for these things. The threats to unity are different, but there's much that we can learn from the early church and Paul here. If we have ears to hear and eyes to see, we will find that this passage contains good instruction about how we welcome one another genuinely, how we live with grace and love for all, how we recognize that it is God who alone judges us. Because even if we aren't arguing about food laws or even vegetarians at our own potlucks, We do have opinions and beliefs about how things should be done in the church and by other Christians. We have opinions about how Christians should talk and dress and vote and which version of the Lord's Prayer they should say and what kind of music they should listen to and how they should behave in church and elsewhere. Can Jesus free us from that? Can love prevail in the midst of such diversity? Paul gives his church some advice about living together with mutual love and respect. And first, he says, welcome others without suspicion. Welcome others without suspicion. First one, welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Now, yes, I do see the irony of Paul writing this whole passage about not passing judgment on others while at the same time making sure that we know who is weak in their faith. It's those vegetable eaters, right? But maybe Paul is speaking to people in the church who he knows believes that they are the strong ones. Don't we also assume that we are the strong ones? It's everyone else who's weak in their faith, not us. We have it right. They should listen to us when we tell them what they should do differently. A good rule, says Paul, is to welcome those who are weak in the faith or new to the faith or from a different branch of the faith family tree without intending to quarrel with them until they are more like you. 
Don't quarrel over opinions. Verse two, don't secretly despise the ones you're welcoming. Don't pass judgment on others. Why? Verse three, because God has welcomed them. Do you remember when God welcomed you? Do you remember that God still welcomes you? Can you think of any reason that God might not have welcomed you to his family? I myself can make a list of about 20 reasons God might have found me to be less than desirable as a disciple or a pastor, might have passed me over with his grace and welcome. But here I am, welcome and forgiven and freed anyway. Paul frames the suspicion about differences against the welcome that God has extended to all believers. If God is the one who welcomes, who are we to quarrel and despise and judge? Paul writes, verse 5, let all be fully convinced in their own minds. I had my book of order out last week during the sermon talking about the discipline section of the book of order. I didn't bring it this week, but what Paul is talking about here is a basis of how we are governed together as Presbyterians. We call it mutual forbearance when we let everyone be convinced in their own minds. We are a church where we recognize that people believe differently about all kinds of things. We are not to fight about it or be suspicious about the sincerity of faith of one another who believe differently than we do. Because we are invited to understand that we all have the same goal, God's glory. Here, Paul writes, those who observe the day, observe it for the Lord. Also, those who eat, eat for the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain for the Lord and give thanks to God. Rather than being suspicious of one another, we are invited to believe that each person is doing whatever it is that they are doing and believing what they are believing, giving thanks to God and doing it for the sake of the Lord. When we learn to regard one another with the same welcome that God extends to us all, believing the best about each other rather than being distrustful, we are living as a church that honors Christ. Second, trust God to work in the lives of others. Trust God to work in the lives of others. In verse 7, we are reminded that we do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. The beauty of our living and our dying is that we are connected to one another from our birth until our death. All these people who come alongside us, who come into relationship with us, are not projects for us to work on, but gifts from God. Eugene Peterson, a Presbyterian pastor who translated the message version of the Bible, wrote this in his memoir. It's called The Pastor. He wrote, a congregation is a company of people who are defined by their creation in the image of God, living souls, whether they know it or not. They are not problems to be fixed, but mysteries to be honored and revered. When we look around at our fellow worshipers, we should remember that these people are not problems or projects whom we are trying to mold into our own image but co-travelers created in God's image. When you look at your worship neighbor, go ahead, look at your worship neighbor for a moment. Just look around. When you look at your worship neighbor, the image of God, what a gift, a mystery to be revered, says Eugene Peterson. We are connected to one another And together, we have one Lord. We have Jesus Christ as the head of our church and our individual lives. 
Here again, these beautiful and faithful words from verses 8 and 9. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Let me tell you a secret. Your life will become much lighter Your heart will be less burdened. Your hands will unclench when you receive this. You cannot change anybody. And you don't have to. That's what Paul is saying here. Transforming people into who God is calling them to be. It's not our job. That's the work of God, who is Lord of both the living and the dead. And let me tell you another secret. The Lord does not work on our timetable. It only takes a moment for God to change a heart, but it can take a lifetime to become who God is making you to be. We are always works in progress. And that goes for our siblings in Christ, every single one of them. We can trust that just as God has worked and is working in our lives, God is working and will continue to work in their lives too. Finally, Paul says, let God be the judge of all. Let God be the judge of all. Paul has reminded his church that it is God who gave the ultimate welcome, and they are to mirror this welcome as they receive others. Here at the end of this section, Paul now reminds the church in Rome that God is also the one who is the ultimate judge, and that they are to remember that each of them and each of everybody else will be accountable to God. Verse 10, why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? For why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us will be held accountable. Not only is it not your job to change anyone else, it's also not your job to judge anyone else. Marilyn read from John 3 earlier, the beautiful passage where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus the Pharisee and says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. We know that verse well. But then Jesus keeps talking and says, Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Someone recently quipped, if God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, I doubt he sent you to do it either. Let God be the judge of all. And if God is not condemning, then neither should we. If we are on a mission of fault finding in others, we usually aren't taking the time to look appropriately at our own lives and to assess our own words and deeds, what we have done and left undone, repenting for, before God, who alone is our judge. Romans 14 is definitely one of those. It's all that easy and it's all that hard passages of scripture. I'm sure that these 13 verses poured from Paul's pen with such ease, and yet were received by a church who probably had to read them again and again as they navigated life together amid such diversity that threatened their unity and growth. May we too read them again and again and seek to live as people who welcome others as God welcomes us, without suspicion or hatred or judgment, who trust that the Lord is at work in the lives of others, just as he is working in our own lives, who know that it is God alone who will call us to account and judge our words and actions, 
we don't have to play that role in the life of anyone else even when we find their words or their actions disagreeable or unsavory, even if they are bringing a vegetarian dish to the potluck. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, God who welcomes, God who transforms, God who judges. May we be changed, not because others require it of us, but because you are changing us. Help us to be people who seek your goodness and unity in our body, who avoid quarreling and judging the words and actions of others, who welcome all who would come despite the differences they bring. Your image is beautifully reflected in the diversity of your body. Help our church reflect that beauty to the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.